right. Hey, everybody, welcome. Thank you for joining our next art activation call. I am Joe Macheda, the Civic Arts Coordinator for Burning Man. Thrilled to see you all here. And we're also gonna drop a little poll to kind of get a sense of who everyone is or what you're interested in hearing about while we're on the call. While that's going, I'm gonna introduce our Director of Civic Activation, Christopher Breedlove, to tell you a little bit more about the entire series that we've been working on uh, called Global Activation. Breedlove. Hey, thanks, Joe. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm just gonna give you a quick kind of uh, setting to, to what we're doing here. You know, over the past several months, we've been trying to host a series of community conversations that have really been focusing on different areas that we see burners activating around the globe. And so that has involved arts and events, grants, civics, ecosystems, and communities. And so we're now back kind of at the end of doing one whole cycle of those, and we're back where we started with art activation. And I just wanna say I'm super excited about this call because I know this team has been working really hard on it and uh, I'm glad in my own way that we're going back to Reno because I know how important Reno is at the end of the day with so much of the art that Burning Man does out in the world. So thanks so much, Joe, and super looking forward to this. Awesome, thanks, Christopher. Okay, what do we got? It looks like a lot of artists. We have 29% of folks who have, who uh, identify as artists who have had their work displayed publicly. 21% uh, are interested in displaying your work or supporting public art initiatives. A lot of folks are interested in just learning more. I haven't seen anything else in the chat about uh, who else you are, but we'll get to that and we'll, uh, we'll try to hone and connect with uh, everybody's interests on the call. So just a general overview of what we're doing with art activation is really trying to highlight um, voices of people within the community, whether they've been to Bur Burning Man or not, um, but people who are um, really connecting with their communities and doing things, um, inventing the wheel, if you will, um, and taking what we can to learn from this and, and give people the tools and information um, to apply those learnings to whatever you're interested in doing. So with that, um, I'm really excited about this call. I, as I said, I'm the Civic Arts Coordinator for Burning Man. I've done a number of installations in partnering with municipalities, um, all different kinds of organizations over the almost seven years now. Um, so I'm coming from that background. I'll be introducing Maria Partridge, who has her own um, kind of take on, on this work. And we're gonna just kind of pit back and forth and have a conversation and jump in uh, to answer any of your questions as they come through. Feel free to put those in the chat. Um, we'll take them after Maria's presentation and I've teed up a few of my own questions to kind of get the ball rolling. Um, but again, please put them in the chat. We'll have Sage and Emma who are, um, have the uh, public art background are part of our team. Thank you both for being here. They're gonna be fielding those. We'll try to synthesize um, the type of questions that are coming in. So we might not ask your question exactly, but we'll, uh, we're gonna to try to hit a range of what everyone's interested in hearing about. Um, again, if you wanna put on your videos, that's great. If not, no big deal. Um, we'll be recording this and sharing out um, after the call. All right, Maria Partridge, the founder of the Reno Playa Art Park, one of the most amazing things in Reno. Um, I'm gonna keep it short and sweet and let you share everything that you've got. Uh, Maria, thanks okay. so much for being here. Okay. Um, well, um, just a little bit about my background. I've been a project manager for Burning Man um, since 2012. Back in the day, I was the artist advocate. So I worked with all the self-funded artists. And um, uh, since then, of course, we're now up to like over 400 projects. And so it's crazy. And there's a lot of us. Um, but uh, one of the things was that, and I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and start my presentation, but um, I actually, let me cue this up because it's been a little bit slow. So um, one of the ways that I got involved with Bernie Mann is that I had never even been to the event and I met Crimson Rose at an event here in Reno at the Nevada Museum of Art. And I told her that um, I was really interested in the art of Burning Man, but I didn't really want to go to the event. And uh, I said I didn't camp. 
but anyway, so she said, why don't you just come out, you know, just come out for the day. So I did and I, and, um, she, I went on an art tour and I was like, okay, this stuff has to come to Reno. So um, we started talking and she said, well, we need to, um, you know, find a location and it, you know, someplace downtown. And we looked and looked and she actually came across this empty lot behind the Sierra Arts Foundation and said, what about this? And so um, I did the research. I found, so a lot of what I'm going to be saying is um, how I navigated all of this, because I did not have a public art background. And so I hope that people will kind of learn from the experience. So for instance, this was an empty lot. So um, I had to find out who owned the, the empty lot. So I found out who owned the empty lot. And then I talked to the people who owned the empty lot and they said, yeah, sure. It's, you know, th they didn't look good in the city's eyes because it was blight. Um, and so we were gonna make it look good. So they, so the, the owners of the private property went along with it. And then it was working with the city to try and convince them to bring some Burning Man art um, to Reno. And uh, we wanted to do uh, an installation, but the thing about it was that <clears throat> um, you, it, it was gonna be temporary. It couldn't cost a lot of money. Um, at the time, Braff was actually the supporter as well as the city of Reno. And so at that, that year we did the mangrove. And so we had these Still, small so, uh, we had waiting trees for slides. That, that were um, under, you know, like 16 feet tall um, that surrounded the man. And so uh, it was perfect. And it was something that the city could wrap their brain around because it was because of the scale of it. So we ended up having 11 trees by five different artist collectives. And this is a, an old photo of the trees that were um, on Playa and then when we installed them in downtown Reno. Um, and I know it's gonna be slow, huh? Hang on. So I don't know if the slides changed yet. It'll take a few seconds, but anyway, that actually grew so that each year we started bringing art to this same empty lot. Um, we did Celtic Forest um, and uh, by uh, Laura Kipton and Jeff Schomburg. And that was the first time that we actually had fire. And you can see the um, fire in the lower right. Uh, and it was, um, we realized that we weren't just placing artwork, that we were actually creating community gathering spots. And this was different. And it also became this conversation with the city of Reno and that it became this cultural collaboration where we were actually bringing the culture of Burning Man to downtown Reno. And we couldn't do that without having metal and fire. So these are, um, and then there's Kate Roudenbush's Dual Nature. That was 2010. So of course we had to really do Burning Man at least once, right? And so I don't think they'll ever let me do this again, but um, this was 48 feet tall. It was Spire of Fire. It was up about a year. Each one of these were temporary art installations and they were like three months, six months. This one was actually up for a year and we would actually do fire and participants could actually control the fire. Um, and it was incredible. And this, this is the one that really put it on the map as far as Reno um, collaborating with Burning Man and, and really sharing the culture. And uh, people, were, people were lined up with um, lawn chairs you know, when we, we would do this every week. So we did it every week for a month and then we did it once a month. So that eventually grew and, and we were building the relationship with Reno um, throughout this time. And so these are actually several of the permanent sculptures that are now in Reno. Um, and there was um, uh, Tree Spire by Tabasco and the Iron Monkeys. Uh, and then uh, Portal of Evolution was temporary. And these were all temporary sculptures that then the city fell in love with. And it was an easy sell to the people and to be able to place this art. Um, it, it was, I found that it was much easier to actually install temporary art and then convince the city that they wanted to keep it or the, the people wanted to keep it. And it is to say, I've got this giant butterfly that's actually a female reproductive system, just in case you might want it. And that just, you know, that would, that would be kind of a hard sell. So from there, um, I'm kind of waiting for the slide to catch up. Uh, so what happened is that we established this relationship with the city of Reno and 
uh, I decided that uh, Brad was no longer, Burning Man Project was a, its own nonprofit. There was a lot of transition going on, but I wanted to continue this, this project. And I liked the idea of creating these um, playa art parks. And one of the things I was doing as a project manager at Burning Man was that the art was starting to get bigger and bigger and bigger on playa. And so a lot of the small artists that I had worked with for many, many years um, were starting to feel lost. And so I said, hey, let's create a playa art park at Burning Man, which consists of smaller sculptures, um, which is usually across from the artery. And, and then I thought, why not take some of those smaller sculptures and bring them into a civic environment as public art? Number one, the budget was smaller. Um, I have, I've raised every cent to do all of this. Um, the city of Reno gave us a grant and um, Bernie Mann um, gave us a global art grant at that time, which was like 2017, I wanna say. Um, so what happened was that um, it was really interesting. At this point, we had formed a relationship so that um, the, the art was to be decided, the location was to be decided, and they gave me money anyway, which is really great. <laughs> so the city had knocked down these old motels and they didn't own the property and it was a blight on down, in downtown Reno on Virginia Street. Um, so they asked me to put the play art, the first play art park on this lot, and I was a little nervous because it was kind of sketchy, and I was afraid that the art would be destroyed. But um, the artists all had a leap of faith, and we just said, "All right, let's do it." Oops. Um, so I'm waiting. Anyway, so this lot was across the street from Circus Circus and the El Dorado which is now called The Row. Um, the, it was a blank wall. I mean, as you can tell, it's not very pretty. You can see one of the old motels to the left there that were all over that particular lot. Um, so uh, I actually, it, I mean, that wall just screamed for a mural. So I approached Josie Rock and said, I don't have any money, but can you do this and I'll raise the money. And he said, well, how much money do you have? And I said, $1,500. And he said, it's, that's like a $10,000 mural. And I said, how about 5,000? And, and I literally would give him a, I'd give him a check like for $500 for the two weeks he was, he was, uh, he was actually painting this. Um, I, I was like, here's another thousand, here's 250, you know? And so I got $5,000, I should have gotten 10,000 for him, but that was the best I could do. But anyway, it was this whole idea, again, of community coming together to create this space. Um, so this was the first incarnation. <clears throat> so the art started to get, I was able to actually start raising more money each year because the art was more interesting. And so I got support from the casinos, I got support from the city, I got individual donors. That's always one of the questions, like how do you, how do you finance these things? Um, so these are some of the sculptures. We, we did the Playa Art Park for four years. These are some of the sculptures that um, were there throughout um, those four years. All iconic. Um, the other thing is we would have uh, openings and we received um, the, the mayor spoke when we did it for the first time. And it was a, it was a really big deal. It was a really big thing for a city. I had to present to, the, to city council. It had to be approved by the Reno Arts and Culture Commission, the Public Art Committee. Um, and then the city really embraced it. Um, and uh, we just did what we do, which is we brought stilt walkers and fire spinners and we just created a fly art park. Um, now, one of the things that um, I really loved about this whole project, and we're continuing to do this, is that a lot of the projects that were actually in the Playa Art Park have then moved on to other cities. So uh, the city of uh, Davis, California um, asked um, about art for a couple of their parks. And so Good Luck Horseshoe and Imago, the two up there, uh, went from the original Playa Art Park to Davis. And then um, the angel wings, the chicken and the horse are currently at a, um, an equestrian center in Reno. And then the heart was just installed in Sparks. And um, that's the first time that Sparks has had public art from Reno. And so that's the beginning of a new relationship. 
So the other thing is, um, uh, is working with um, developers. I mean, you know, artists bring amazing art to Burning Man and uh, there's an opportunity to actually place that art as temporary art or as permanent art and, and work with um, businesses. And so this is the first time that we actually did this. Um, and this was working with the new owner of the Sands Regency. They were creating the Reno Neon Line, Jacobs Entertainment. And so he approached me about um, bringing some Burning Man art. And so we ended up starting out with four sculptures that were installed uh, last year before the event. Um, and we have um, the Rearing Horse by Barry Crawford, um, Desert Guard by Lu Ming, the Beijing Burners, um, Michael Christian's Bloom, and then Charlie Gaddikin's Squared. So these are all now on uh, downtown Fourth, or they're, at, they're in front of the Sands uh, along Fourth Street. Uh, these are the first four that are, have been installed. They'll be up for two to four years. Um, people are interested in the logistics of this, and I'm sure we'll have some questions as we move along. Um, as you can tell, the foundations of these particular sculptures are really very, very over-engineered, which is because they wanted them to be big enough for a small sculpture or big enough for a 48-foot tall sculpture. And these sculptures will be rotated out, so it, it, they needed to be robust enough that um, we could continue um, welding, taking them off, and then and then you know reinstalling something new. So, so the the right now this is what's going to be on Fourth Street. We have the four that you saw on the last slide, and then we just installed the polar bear. And, um, and then Broken But Still Together um, by Michael Benesty, um, the Polar Bears by Don Cannell. Uh, those were just installed a month ago. And then um, Tara McEnye by Dana Albany will be installed in the spring. And again, these are all on 4th Street. And then moving forward, I wanted to end with this slide because I'm working with another developer in Reno and these are the three sculptures that, that they've chosen. So I'm really excited that during this time, we're actually gonna be installing three more sculptures in Reno. Um, uh, the, this is uh, Aurora by Charlie Gaddigan. It's actually gonna be another uh, tree by Charlie, um, but um, this, was, this was the original idea. And then Portal by um, David Oliver, and then Passage by Dana Albany. So those are all gonna be installed in 2021. So that's, that's where we're at in Reno. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you, Maria. Did we hit the end of the, did I cut you off or are we good? Okay. Nope, I'm gonna hit it's gone. Okay. stop sharing. Okay. Just a little delay on the. I know, I'm sorry. All good, no, all good. Uh, it's amazing. Your work is incredible. You've done so much in sh such a short period of time and I feel like really have created a template um, that people can emulate or take pieces that are relevant to their work and, and apply to their own. Um, my goal with this conversation is to, again, give an overview of what this work entails um, and potentially break this out into more granular, deeper dives, um, depending on what people are interested in seeing. Um, and if not, there might be materials that will produce and make available online that aren't in the, the this same format. Um, so what's important to me right now is to hear from all of you if you want to drop your questions in the chat of what you really are interested in hearing about. Um, and to start off, I'm just going to kind of go through what I see as kind of three different phases of, of developing this type of work. Again, I know there are some artists that might want to hear specifics of what they need to know, um, people who work for municipalities who might have a different stake in understanding how to develop a program to support this kind of work. Um, we want to talk about as much of it as we can, but again, I want to get the most out of um, this experience with all of you, so um, your questions are much encouraged. Um, but Maria, let's just go and see what comes in. I think one of the first things that uh, jumps out to me is how you set the stage for um, just investigating what might be possible and starting starting with what you see right in front of you. Um, so just the idea of site identification and and blight as like this kind of low-hanging fruit of something that 
um, a city might be amenable to supporting doing temporary development with, I think is really important. Um, do you want to talk any more about um, any challenges or what you saw as opportunities in, in identifying a site or anything that you might have first thought was a great idea and then moved away from before you, before you landed on the, on the parking lot? Well, yeah, actually what happens is that they get sold. So, um, so we originally were behind the Sierra Arts Foundation and then they um, turned that into um, a container bar thing, and, which was great, yay. Um, so then we moved on to the, the um, installation site that was on um, Virginia Street and then they sold that um, just recently. And so um, the idea behind the Playa Art Park and I've, and I've spoken to regionals in Sacramento and um, uh, Davis and Seattle. And um, the idea is that um, you, that you work with the city to actually um, create, to find either private property or um, something in an area that needs some love. And that's what we do, you know, we're burners. We come in there, we, we you know, put some art in there and, and create a community gathering spot, basically. Um, so it's it's always my idea but behind the playa art park is that it is that it's always ephemeral it's not it's never going to be in the same place forever um so for instance right now i'm looking at an empty lot on fourth street because the sands has already invested so much money in um art there and they own all of fourth street and and they've slowed down development so i said I had a conversation with them and i said hey could you be my um, land sponsor? Is what I called it. I said, could you be my land sponsor? And um, and they said, well, we don't want to, you know, give you any money. And I said, um, great. I said, but can you do fencing? Can you do security? Can you do electricity? Um, you know, so I negotiate those kinds of in kind things that they could do for you. Awesome. Um, I see a question that kind of relates to this from Kate um, about that said, I'm interested in finding out how to introduce the idea of public art in a fresh city, setting up the infrastructure. Um, and I'm going to lob that one to myself real quick. Um, the city of San Francisco is something that is, has an example that Burning Man had involvement with, actually the Black Rock Arts Foundation that Maria referenced in her presentation. So. Um, there is a space in Hayes Valley called Patricia's Green, which initially was um, a space that the freeway uh, existed on before the Loma Prieta earthquake, which then had to be taken down and left a giant open blighted uh, space in a neighborhood that didn't really have a lot of community or connection to it. Um, so the Black Rock Arts Foundation worked with uh, then Mayor Gavin Newsom to kind of cut through some of the red tape and develop um, what would become a permanent pad intended for temporary art. Um, and Burning Man, through that process, um, developed relationships with the San Francisco Arts Commission, helped um, kind of foster a, a, a program of introducing art into the area that has then really revitalized or created kind of an entirely new um, community and neighborhood. Burning Man isn't involved in that directly anymore. It's kind of um, up on its feet and has its own um, RFP pool and artists submit and, and rotate every one to two years for installations there. So that's one place to look at, Kate, as an example. And I'm happy to share more offline about that if you're interested. Um, OK, thanks for letting me take that one, Maria. Well, I actually do see some interesting yeah. questions in there. And <laughs> like one of them, I, and I do want to stress this, that artists are paid for their work. Um, when I do the Playa Art Park, um, the honorarium is, is you know, minimum because I'm personally raising it all and I'm a nonprofit. Um, I do this all through Art Tech. Um, but I also forge these relationships so that when I have the opportunity of working with a developer who actually has more money, um, you know, I help negotiate and liaison uh, those contracts as well. So um, it, it, it's a good way for, I, I really insist that artists get paid no matter what. And um, it, it's, it's really important to me that that, that 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 happens. This is not, don't, you know, I, I hate it when people say, oh, well, you're going to have to store it anyway. How about you put it on my land for free? You know, that's not this. Yeah, 
good point. Um, and there's questions, I know there's questions about permits and things like that. Yeah, I'm kind of trying to synthesize what comes through, but if you want to yeah. nab a few as you go, go for it. Well, and the, the thing about the, one of the things I want to say too is that it's, it's much easier to place um, art that has been engineered than it is to reverse engineer it. Um, I can get away with things with the Playa Art Park because it's smaller and because I'm a nonprofit and because they just let me. Um, but in general, um, it's way easier if the work is already engineered instead of having to reverse engineer it. So like if, if I'm working with a developer, that becomes a big part of the conversation. And so if you're artists and you, you want to create something for Burning Man um, and, and you want it to go out into the world, it's really important that it be engineered. And so, yeah, what you mean by that is often people will bring work to the playa um, that can just be anchored into the playa without um, necessarily having a licensed engineer in your state wet stamp, um, do calculations for wet stamp drawings to make sure that it's seismically sound, that it's not gonna fall over, gets hit by a car or any number of things. Um, what we have found is um, municipalities don't really have a, a template for dealing with public art. So often what happens is um, the, question, the question will be applied to, the question about the work is applied to what uh, a regular building would be looked at as. So what Maria was talking about, pieces often being over-engineered, is um, the fact that there isn't specific code for public art. Um, that's another reason something like the um, Patricia's Green art pad is a really amazing tool to allow for lots of different types of installations to come in without having to have that engineering. But if you're starting from scratch and thinking of, um, you know, trying out prototyping a piece in the desert, it costs a little bit more money or potentially a lot more money, depending on the size of your piece, to have an engineer wet stamp your piece but then you will walk away with something that doesn't have to have a brand new base installed to meet city requirements. So I hope that answers that question. Um, again, I'm kind of trying to synthesize these. I'm seeing things about liability, climbing, <laughs> insurance. So for insurance, um, one of the reasons, so um, we're a nonprofit and I actually, when I'm working with um, a private property and I'm doing the installation, um, I'm working with the city, I'm working with the artists, I'm doing all of that, I'm also insuring it. Um, so um, artists can um, personally insure their work if they're afraid that somebody's gonna come, out, come after them personally if somebody climbs it and falls off of it. Um, but I actually take the brunt of um, pleasing the city and the person who owns the land. And that's gonna depend on the type of partnership that exists. I'm gonna keep going back to um, San Francisco. I also worked on a project. Um, we have a partnership with the city of San Jose called Playa to Paseo. And each of these partnerships have their own kind of process or requirements. Um, everybody that I've worked with, all artists will carry their own liability insurance. Um, and often the city, you're not gonna have anything installed if it hasn't been wet stamped um, in, a, in a major city because of liability. Um, but often cities insurance won't cover liability for the art piece, even if you have that. So artists will often opt to cover themselves in addition to um, whatever arrangement they make with the city. And that depends on the, the durate, the cost of it depends on the duration of the installation, the value of the work, um, there's a, a, a lot of different factors, but I would say in a six month period, you could be anywhere from one to $5,000, depending on the work. Um, climbing is an interesting one. What we expect people to do with work um, at Black Rock City isn't necessarily the behavior that people um, assume to be able to do in cities. So I've done a number of installations um, in the downtown core of San Jose, and that's been the biggest concern every time is what if someone jumps on this? What if someone tries to destroy this? And for the most part, we've had very little, um, not a lot of that activity. People just don't see 
work as in the same way once it's in a city as like an, an invitation to climb. Um, again, that doesn't mean that it, it won't happen, but in terms of like the tone of how people seem to receive work in public space, it hasn't been a huge issue in the time that I've been overseeing this type of work. And so for me, because we're so close to Burning Man and we have so many burners in Reno, um, they feel comfortable continuing to climb the sculptures. They feel like it's their right to climb the sculptures. Um, so uh, it's not unusual to see someone on top of um, Kate Robinbush's Guardian of Eden at the Nevada Museum of Art, um, you know, it, it was meant to be climbed. Um, or Portal of Evolution, the butterfly actually has steps in order to climb it. We used to have a sign that said, do not climb and uh, 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 Brian Tedrick wanted to say, do not fall was his idea. And there are times when I would look during an event and there would be all these people on top of the butterfly and I just think, ugh, and the police would just go over there and tell them to, to get down. When the city actually bought the sculpture, they wanted Brian to actually take off the steps. And he said that would be like scarring his sculpture. And he said, no. And he basically said, no, take it as it is. And they did. And so it still has the steps if you want to climb it. Um, Gordon, did I answer your question about um, engineering? Was that clear enough? Somebody asked about what a wet stamp was. Okay, yeah, I'm seeing a few and now I'm like, maybe I should go over that more. How are okay. we? You can unmute if you, if, if anyone is still interested in me going a little bit more in depth in that, I'm happy I'd to like share. A little more detail in what kind of structural engineering the city you're interested in, in terms of, so like I'm an engineer, I don't have a PE, but I could get one if it would be useful, but I don't quite know what certifications you're looking for. Wind when loads, wind loads, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and uh, uh, structurally, wh what I find that they're most interested in is how it's gonna be attached to the base, not so much from here up, unless it's like 48 feet tall, then, then they're, you know, they wanna, they wanna know that those footings are gonna support that 48 foot tall sculpture, basically. And, the, and, then, and then the calculations are different for California than they are for Nevada. Yeah. You probably know that. And I would add that um, as flexible um, as you can make your base in terms of um, where it's gonna be applied, something that's gonna live on asphalt versus um, you know, concrete, which I didn't know were two different things until I started doing this work, um, really matters. So thinking through having the most flexible base, because um, that is where most of your money is gonna be spent on engineering or reworking the physical structure to be applied to the site that it's gonna live on. Okay, I'm trying to read through the chat and um, keep things flowing. Marie, do you have any that you wanna jump in on? Um, people are, uh, O'Connor was asking about, for, about grants. Um, it's tough. It's tough. Funding is really tough um, for me. Uh, and uh, I, you know, I, I think actually, Joe, you were going to say something about the Global Art Grant. Um, I received two, um, but they're no longer available for art parks. Um, it, so uh, I basically get funding that I can from um, businesses. I think Raspa mentioned. Um, uh, something about uh, permanent paths for um, temporary art, which is exactly what I'm doing with the sands, is that they're going to end up putting, he wants three more sculptures, so they're going to end up putting um, uh, like eight to ten sculptures along 4th Street, and they're going to be swapped out every two to four years, and with the idea being that a new one will come from Burning Man or two or, you know, whatever. Um, so he, he was really thinking ahead, and that's why those, those foundations, as I showed you, were so robust. Um, but, uh, you know, that's a private person with a major business development thing going. As far as, like, the city, um, I think that the Playa Art Parks are, work best for regional groups that would like to do something in their city because they have the, the volunteers. Um, I use a lot of volunteers. I use a lot of in-kind. I use um, heavy equipment, you know, people who have heavy equipment. Um, 
so much of it is grassroots when it comes to doing these playa art park installations. Um, the grants, um, I don't know about like, like international grants or, or things like that. Um, it would be it would be good if we could make that happen. There's more funding. Yeah. Um, again, this is kind of the the like scrappy element of what this work yeah. is. Is we are still in a very nascent part in this country of supporting this type of work. One example I can give in terms of funding that is there there wasn't a clear path. There's a group called the Flaming Lotus Girls who had a piece installed first on Playa. Then it went through the San Francisco Arts Commission and was installed uh, one of the peers. And then they took it down and one of the members of uh, Flaming Lotus Girls lives in Vallejo, California, um, got very connected with local government. I believe she even got a seat um, on the city council um, and really wrote the book rather than had uh, wrote the book on like how to approach this, meaning um, they thought through every engineering question, every safety concern that uh, a small municipality might be afraid of and like not even think to ask about until you have already gone halfway into a proposal. Um, so they really came with a fully realized presentation and uh, proposed an installation, um, a permanent installation in the city of Vallejo and then started talking about where the funding could come from and um, what the general impact um, having a piece like that might have for a, a small town. If you're not that familiar with the history of Vallejo, they went bankrupt at one point. Um, so the downtown area was pretty you know, rough trodden and they were looking for something to draw people back into the downtown area. And so that was part of their pitch was economic development if we put a little bit more money into investing into the infrastructure to, to support work like this, um, we might find uh, you know, a positive draw. So that was a really great um, example of just a few artists and a few connections working with a small municipality, but having a really clear idea of what they were going for and what the, the outcomes would be um, if some, money would be invested in in something that might not normally be considered a, a public investment. I thought that there was, and to go along with that, I thought that somebody had a question about the Arts and Culture Commission. Um, I really encourage um, people who are interested in bringing these par parks in, apply art park or creating something like that. I was on the Public Art Committee and the Reno Arts and Culture Commission for several years. I did, I did my duty. Um, and uh, um, I am not that person. I do not like sitting in government meetings. I do not like it. And in fact, I would text Crimson and she's like, take one for the team. Okay. But I learned a lot. She was so right. I really learned a lot. And I know that Brody um, is on the Arts and Culture, or I think, I think she's on the Arts and Culture Commission for... Um, yeah, yeah. And so I think it's really, really important, as boring as those meetings are, and I know that Mark Salinas is in the chat there, and he just was, um, he's on the Arts and Culture Commission in Reno now. Uh, it, it's really important to establish those government relationships. It really is. And because you can have those casual conversations and you can find out about the developers that are coming to town um, that might be interested in something that you're doing. And then when those developers are talking to the city people and then they say, well, we're interested in art. And then the city people say, well, why don't you call Maria? Those, that's so important. So whoever asked that question, it's really, really important. Um, I'm seeing one that says, who handles additional services such as lighting and power and landscaping? What if the city is not willing to fund that? Would it be up to the artist in kind? Um, I would say absolutely don't enter into, into a contract if that is not going to be supported. Um, that needs to be considered as part of the holistic vision. Lighting is um, just as important in terms of public safety as it is for the aesthetics. Um, and I, I don't want to go too long on about this, but it really does depend on the partner on the site. Um, if it's a public space, you might have um, an arts commission as the person that you're contracted with, and the arts commission would then be 
um, I would ask the Arts Commission to be responsible for interfacing with uh, Rec and Park organization if you if that work is being installed um, in a public park. You need to know all of the agencies that are going to be involved and make sure that the all of those details are outlined in a contract before you move forward. You well, the other Sorry, go ahead. No, I was gonna say the other thing is it depends on, the, on the, what you're doing. Like, it, like with Joe's doing like major projects in San Jose, um, or if you're doing something that's, you know, like when I'm working with the developers, but the Playa Art Parks are organic. I mean, they are literally, um, I raise the money to, every year I'd add thousand, $1,000 worth of gravel. You know, it was like, I would just throw more gravel in there. And as far as the lighting goes, there, that motel that the mural's on, um, I was, I had an extension cord and I ran con conduit underneath the gravel and I had um, friends and volunteers doing that. And that's what lit each one of those sculptures. So, I mean, it, you know, it, it's gritty, it's temporary um, and, and that's fine for that venue. Um, yeah, no landscaping. Okay. Nikki asked something that I was just about to try to touch on. What is the application process for existing Burning Man art pieces to possibly display it at the Reno Art, art Park? Um, for um, anybody is what, if anybody has art in the, and they're interested in, in reaching out to me, I am more than happy to. I mean, I, I know so many artists, I've been doing this for so many years, um, and I usually manage uh, over 100 projects every year since 2012. Um, but I, I don't remember everybody and I don't you know, know who's got what. Um, I don't generally do a call out to artists, but certainly artists have reached out to me and said, I have this piece, it needs a new home. Um, and so then I just put it in the back of my mind. I know, Joe, you keep track of, of art. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know, are, do we, are we gonna have some kind of inventory? thing eventually we, yeah that's a, that's part of the dream that's also part of the dream the yeah. process is kind of working through how we're going to develop tools to put online for for yeah. yeah sites as well as artists to to connect totally um I, can we backtrack and answer abe uh just clarifying would you pay personally for the gravel to the gravel and friend labor do i pay yeah yeah i, I do uh-huh and I go get it, um, uh, and I have volunteers spread it. Uh, so, um, but I also get it. You know, I get a good deal from uh, Truckee River. And this isn't an ad for Truckee River Rock and whatever it's called, but but they're great. You know, it's like I'm a nonprofit. I every you know I go in there. I'm like, can I get some more gravel? And and you know, they may even deliver it and not charge me for that. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, you can see the gravel in the background behind Joe and me. And it looks really nice because that was like three years worth of gravel. <laughs> and I wouldn't expect this every time, but Maria's literally brought me lunch at Art Tech, like sandwiches and chips because I flew in, went straight from the airport to Art Tech to work on the art piece. She, she's incredible. So when she says grassroots, she means grassroots, like bringing a sandwich. So and she, the, the connection she has is incredible, whether it be, you know, large, you know, if you need a big forklift, you need power, you need electrician, they find it, you know. So yeah, we find it. <laughs> Hi, Shane. <laughs> um, okay, how about which relationships felt the most important or in order to make the art park successful? Cities, casinos, property owners, local artist groups, artists. Uh, Reno burners, number one, um, and then um, city of Reno, um, and. Uh, um, so, I mean, certainly, I mean, like Shane said, I mean, the artists, the artist crew, um, I, I really uh, work with the casinos to get free rooms um, and, uh, and then heavy equipment. I call um, everybody and ask them for the best deal that I can get. Um, and then, uh, you know, so it really is a, a, a community project. And I have to say, that when I've had to, I had to deinstall in the middle of the pandemic and they needed all the art out of the art park um, by May 1st. And I was like, we're in the middle of a pandemic, everybody's in lockdown. And they're like, well, and then I said, well, you need to give me $2,000 towards that. <laughs> so um, they did, but uh, I called 20 volunteers and 
everybody showed up with masks and gloves on and I was just like, thank you. And we literally, and I also needed heavy equipment and I needed semis to, to, and trailers to get everything out. And, um, you know, sure enough, I, you know, called Brad Pike and he goes, well, lucky, lucky for you, you have friends with uh, heavy equipment and semis and trailers. And so we had four trailers and we got everything out of there within a day. It was amazing. So, and 20 volunteers. So it takes a village. Definitely. That's a, a rare and rich community that you're <laughs> it's in. It's very expensive when you don't have people willing to just uh, pitch in. Um, one thing that we haven't talked a lot about um, that I'm interested in talking about is um, activation once work has been installed. How much your role is in creating events, things that are and meaningful experiences that make the, the space come alive? It's really important for, to the city. And yeah. so it's actually part of, um, and I'm responsible for that. So when I do a final report, it's like they want to they want to see it activated, you know? And so um, one of the things that Artec does is we run the Reno Art Fest. So I would do Reno Art, I would close off Virginia Street and run Reno Art Fest, which is, you know, your classic art festival with artists in white tents selling their stuff. It was curated. Um, so I, that's what I did. So I would use, I used the space in front of the Playa Art Park to do the Reno Art Fest. And so people were in the Reno Art Park, and then there's an empty lot to the side of it, and I did a fire festival there, and the casino um, was able to give us a, um, a stage, uh, and you know, at, at a lower cost. I have somebody who's literally in charge of entertainment. Um, Jenny Jinx is probably on the call, or um, she's, uh, you know, she she runs, she uh, uh, is a fire spinner for Control Burn, and she just uh, she's like how much money do you have and then we just go down the list it's like stilt walkers fire spinners what are we going to do um so we so we do that and and then we'll do um they'll control burn will do um spin fire in the lot and we'll have food trucks and that kind of thing um once a week during the summer so i do a lot to yeah. to keep that space activated yeah the food truck element too, I think, when you have economic benefits to other industries is also yes. a really key motivating factor. Mm -hmm. The partnership that Burning Man currently has with the city of San Jose also has a clause um, that puts it on the Office of Cultural Affairs to activate the work after uh, Burning Man manages the installations. And a lot of what they have done has been focused on um, activation that connects with the intent of the work. So an example would be one of the first installations we did was the Sonic Runway. And if you're not familiar with that, it's a 500 feet of concentric rings of LEDs that react to the speed of sound through light. So you'll hear a pulse of sound at one end and the light will travel uh, literally at the speed of sound. So you can visually see sound coming at you. Um, so ideas of activation, we had, the first thing was, um, you know, a, a big party. We had uh, art cars come with big bassy uh, sound and that was it's like the big kind of flashy opening event. And then after that, we worked with community groups uh, like taiko drummers and uh, choirs and an opera singer all to share their artistic ex expression through the piece. Um, so I think if you have like one thing to consider if you um, want to connect with if you have an idea of what type of events might, you know, work with your piece, connect with groups that might be interested and include that in your proposal of how things oh, might. Yeah. Uh, yeah, definitely, definitely included in your proposal. The more collaborators, the better. Yeah, exactly. Um, are you exploring ways to activate with most of the participants online given COVID? Given COVID? Uh, I would say my work is, I think we're at a phase um, in the pandemic where people are actually looking to get out. And so the city, uh, we put all of our installations on pause just until we really had a temperature and a sense of what, where we were going to head. And um, they're actually looking to find safe, positive ways for people to get out of their homes. So um, yeah, I don't know. If Maria, your experience is any different, or if we, the city, I've, you know, has... I've installed six sculptures in the last few months. 
Um, and uh, it's, you know, and, and like the one in Sparks, um, which uh, Shane with the heart behind him uh, is the artist behind that. Um, that, um, you know, that was, a, that was a big deal because it's in a plaza and it's in front of a movie theater and it's, you know, people are, it's, people want to have their photos taken in front of it. So it really activated this small plaza. And so the, the businesses around it are just really, really grateful. They didn't pay a squat, but you know, it still, it, a lot of what I've placed in the last few months have been about um, getting the work out there and doing something and creating a place for people to go and look at it. And the equestrian facility is open to the public. It's beautiful grounds. The art looks amazing. Um, you know, and it's, you know, and then um, Jacobs um, Entertainment had actually halted all building or anything. We were supposed to install the sculptures, the bear and, and broken in um, April. They said we weren't going to do it until next year. But then, you know, it was like people were like, Joseph, people were like really wanting to do something. And so Jacobs said, okay, we're going to do it in October. And so we did. And it was, um, it was great. And it's not even quite ready, but it's still, it, it, it's still kind of a construction zone, but they're, they've landscaped it, they put all the pavers down, you know, and it just makes that part of the city just look so much nicer. And I think that people want that. Yeah, aesthetics is a huge thing. There's definitely research that can uh, point to economic impact um, as a result of public art. Um, Stephen was asking about measures of success for these kinds of initiatives, and I think there's a whole range. Maria, I'm sure you do too. For me, you could go anywhere from the basic just foot traffic, how many people pass and experience an art piece, um, and you might be able to draw uh, there are resources, some cities have resources to, to demonstrate pedestrian traffic, and then that's an after the fact um, demonstration of drawing in more people to an area. Um, one of my biggest regrets is not document interviewing people um, after a piece was coming down. I've in so many de installs had people come up and say, Wait, where's this going? This is uh, this is the only place my daughter would go on a walk and talk with me about her life or you know this is where you know everybody had these anecdotal stories and I wish I had documented more of those things um, as kind of more visceral um, examples to share with people so thinking creatively of how you might um, talk about the your your impact could influence future installations Maria do you have other thoughts on there was success. Well, there was there was a there was a, at one point the city was talking about having um, you know these kiosks where people could you know um, do it digitally and respond digitally and all of that. But um, it just it it never happened. And you know I I mean I can't afford to do something like that in a, an art park. Um, I I can just say that I do have to report on that when I do a final report. And I always. Um, basically talk about the fact that there are always people in the park. There are always people in the park taking photos and, um, you know, that that's, and they, and they see that city council sees that when they drive by. So, yeah. And having hard data, I know we tracked some of that in San yeah. Jose, how many people attended specific events um, is definitely impactful. I know we're getting close to the end. I want to um, be close to time, but also note that Maria has graciously offered to stick around for a few more calls. If after the call, um, people want to hang out, we'll be here for a few more minutes before we wrap. Um, I also want to share that our next activation call is on December 8th. It's called Ecosystem Activation, Getting Dirty with Regenerative Networks, Digging into Networks that Help Make Healthy Soils, Bring Down Carbon, and Rebuild Ecosystems Started or Run by Burners. Um, so we're just starting up our season two series of global activation calls. We'll have more art activation as well, but there's a whole host of things coming down the pike. Um, I think that's a wrap. Again, we'll, uh, we'll stick around for a little bit longer if anybody wants to ask some more specific questions. Again, if you'd like to put your name in the sign-in sheet, we will follow up with a recording of this video. Maria, we I think we'll also include your PowerPoint with some annotations if anyone's interested in seeing that um, and just a way to stay connected on uh, 
future uh, events that we do. I'm super appreciative for all of you coming. Thank you.